You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with With Sam Sam Steeter. It is Monday. May 14th, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Israelis kill 37 Palestinians, wound 900 in protests taking place in Gaza over the move of the American embassy to Jerusalem. Meanwhile, Mike Pompeo primed to leave our East Asian allies on a limb. Betsy DeVos to end investigations of widespread abuse at for-profit colleges. Rand Paul ready to cave on Gina Haspel. And they cheered for the end of the Iran deal. And now they're afraid they got what they wish for. Meanwhile, Mukhtar al-Sadr primed to pick the new Iraqi leader. And conservatives argue their organizing principle is liberals' mischaracterization of their conservatism. Meanwhile, uh, federal authorities are missing almost 1,500 Migrant miners. And the White House continues to be the leakiest of leaky White Houses. Like the best. The most leaks. The The most most internal strife you've ever seen. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Let's play a little clip of the... um, the, the protests that are going on in uh, Gaza at this point um, as, and we'll play this clip a little bit uh, later, Ivanka and Steve Mnuchin. I don't know why we sent the Treasury Secretary to do this. Um, oh, mm, wonder why, okay. Mm. But uh, uh, nevertheless. Send the Jew contingent. Ivanka and Mnuchin uh, were unveiling the new American embassy in Jerusalem. We'll play that in in a moment. But uh, there were clashes along the Gaza Strip border, of course, basically through fences. Got to have see-through fences. Um, 37 Palestinians. And this is the way that the New York Times, I don't know if you've seen the New York Times headline on this. Nope. Uh, get ready. Find the New York Times headline to put it up because it's pretty... It's pretty amazing um, how these things happen. Is they it, just they just happen to happen. Wait, is it written in the passive voice? It, oh, it's it's beyond the passive voice. Because I was taught not to use the passive voice whenever possible. It's not just the passive voice. It actually goes beyond the passive voice. It is uh, at the Gaza Israel. Oh, no, 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 that's not it. Uh, it's a different one. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll tweet it to you. Uh, that's still pretty cute. But that's still pretty good too, actually. Uh, at the Gaza Israel fence, raw nerves and shots fired. That's uh, that's almost as bad as the new one. But here, let's play a clip of the the violence, the death, the injuries that um, have broken out. That obviously uh, needless, really. I mean, needless. And there are Palestinians with slingshots throwing rocks. They're literally throwing uh, rocks with slingshots. And that's and then that's it. We don't have uh, footage of the. Um, the firing that took place on on the Palestinians. Uh, do you have that tweet that uh, that's going around? People are starting to um, uh, show just how sort of here it is. Here, here's one. Um, 
this is one version right here. It's all over Twitter. But there's even a, a more egregious example of this in the passive. Uh, that wasn't the full link you got to send me. All right. Is there anybody else who who's here that can maybe uh, do this while I'm hosting the show? Nobody else has Twitter in the office. Yeah. Nobody. Is it? I thought it was a good one. I'm not sure which one. Okay, it's on your Twitter. Here it is. Yeah. It's, it's all over on the, the Twitter. <laughs> here we go. Okay, They're, like uh, like on the top of Twitter, I mean, it is at least 28 Palestinians die in protest as U.S. prepared to open Jerusalem. Uh, um, I think Jacobin has it. Um, like l almost every Twitter Twitterer out there is uh, is, no, is putting this out. They change uh, now. It's Israeli troops killed dozens of Palestinians. Yeah. Israeli, you said Israeli troops killed dozens of Palestinian protesters as the U.S. opens embassy in Jerusalem. Uh, they have changed it, I guess, since criticism uh, on Twitter. I mean, here is um, just moments ago, people were retweeting. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, they really have changed it. Um, wow. Wow. Well, at least 28 Palestinians die in protests as U.S. prepares to open Jerusalem embassy. Right, indeed. They just died spontaneously. That's crazy. It is nuts how that will happen. The power of opening embassy will just basically... And, and of course, now that number's up to 37. Um, Not even opening, preparing. Yeah, just the, prepar the preparation. Wow. Uh, but meanwhile, the, I think uh, the Times is getting pushback and they're starting to use the non-passive voice. They're actually trying to use, they're actually using real verbs now. Is there a subject in the sentence now? That's crazy. Indeed. Um, so that's what's going on, uh, Donald Trump. And, and of course, Chuck Schumer put out a, uh, a statement praising this move by, um, by Donald Trump. And uh, I don't know, it's just... I. I I don't know what else to say. I mean, I mean the 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 reasons behind doing this were um, were spurious at best, and it's just going to lead to more violence. Well, and also this is just. I mean, <clears throat> I feel like there hasn't been much room to prevaricate or have excuses about this issue for quite some time. But I mean, if you are still like the only people who should be supporting this Israeli government government and policy should be people like the Trump administration. If you have any semblance of a claim to any type of moderately liberal politics and you're still defending this, then you have to either, you know, exit that politics or really rethink what you're doing. Uh, it's nuts. I mean, we'll talk more about it. We've got a couple more videos. We'll talk more about it uh, later in the program, but it's a, uh, it's, it's distressing. And you see the amount of attention uh, that, that goes to, you know, someone getting stabbed in uh, in Paris. It's terrible, and, and this nothing compared to this. But uh, this is ongoing systemic uh, killing of people. Um, but yeah, granted, they are uh, they do have slingshots. Hey, are, are you paying attention? Uh, not just to this podcast, but to everything. Reading the latest ideas and issues in your favorite magazines. Get all the magazines that matter with Texture. You guys have heard me talk about Texture quite a bit. Um, it, is, it is the go-to app for me when I'm traveling in particular. Because I get to catch up on all my reading. Because I do a, a ton, obviously, of reading on a daily basis. But Texture is the app that offers you over 200 top magazines all in one place. With Texture, you get complete issues and back issues. For titles like Time, The Atlantic, The New Yorker, all in one app. You want something lighter? People, Cosmo, Entertainment Weekly, and my favorite, as you know, Family Handyman. I would say better than People, Cosmo, and Entertainment Weekly combined. Um, 
if you're looking to do maybe just a little brush up on the trim in your house or how to uh, maybe some organizing things for your tool shop. I don't know why I'm promoting them so much, but uh, it's on there. Texture delivers the best of both worlds and newsworthy stories and relaxing entertainment anytime, anywhere. Magazines are where you find quality journalism, beautiful photos, in-depth interviews, perspectives that show you all sides of the story. And with Texture, you can basically create your own magazine. You can, you can see stories and, and put them into a queue, save them for later. It's great. You can deep dive into the issues you care about today with Texture. It's usually $9.99 a month, but they're giving our listeners a free trial. Start your seven-day free trial. Go to texture.com slash majority. Go to texture.com slash majority. Start reading the latest issues of your favorite magazines today. That's texture.com slash majority. And uh, my other bailiwick, folks, of course, is dental hygiene. And I every day, I, I, Saul and I are going through this every day. What's that? I'm teaching him how to brush his teeth. Does he like it? Mm, he does it. He doesn't. It's not a huge argument. But the, the thing I'm trying to get him to do is slow down as he count, counts the, the, the ABCs. Because he thinks as long as he gets through it, it's the same as actually. So he just tries to race through it. But I'm, I'm doing it. But the truth is most of us are brushing our teeth wrong. We're not doing it for long enough. And we forget to change our brush on time. That's because most brands focus on selling flashy gimmicks rather than better brushing, but not Quip. It's an electric toothbrush that costs a fraction of the bulkier brushes, packs the right amount of vibrations to clean your teeth. There's a built-in timer. Guiding pulses help you clean for the full dentist recommended two minutes. Quip subscriptions built for your health. It delivers new brush heads every three months for just five bucks, including free shipping worldwide. It also comes with a suction mount that unsticks to use as a cover for hygienic travel. Everyone loves Quip. They were on Oprah's O list. Nice. They were on Sam's S list. I don't have one of those, but I could. They are named one of Time's best inventions, and it's the first subscription electric toothbrush accepted by the American Dental Association. They're even backed by a network of over 20,000 dentists and hygienists and hundreds of thousands of happy brushers. Quip starts at just 25 bucks. And if you go to getquip.com, that's getquip.com slash majority right now, you'll get your first refill pack free with a Quip electric toothbrush. This is a toothbrush you could actually take with you when you travel too, which for me is huge. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash majority. That's spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash majority. All right, so we're going to have, uh, we're going to take a break in a moment and uh, have Henry Farrell on. It's really, in, in many re respects, an extension of a conversation that we had, I guess it was on Friday, right? Was it on Friday? Yes. Uh, uh, in the uh, fun half, I think it was where we were talking about uh, the notion of, of status loss um, and its relationship to uh, material loss and its uh, factor as a, a driver of, um, at the very least, um, not just racism, but also the sort of uh, the dark web intellectuals. Henry Fowl has a, a nice piece about it up at Vox and... Um, he is a <clears throat> professor of political science at uh, George Washington University. Is that it? Uh, we're going to have him in uh, just a moment. In fact, let's take a break and we'll do that right now.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Professor of Political Science at George Washington University, Henry Farrell. On um, actually, there's there's been, there's there's been plenty of pieces you've written, frankly, that I w- would like to have uh, uh, talked to you about. But we we just caught this one the other day. The intellectual dark web explained what Jordan Peterson has in common with the alt right uh, in Vox. Welcome to the program, Henry. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. So um, let's just start off with the 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 conceit here, and you know we have uh, Barry Weiss who wrote this piece on um, on basically a crew of the the so called intellectual dark web. Just uh, set this set that piece up uh, for us, the Barry Weiss piece, uh, just uh, briefly, if you would. So. Here, what I think Weiss is doing is she's saying that we're in a world at the moment, or we're in an America, where it's very, very hard, according to her, to have free speech and free and fair comment and debate and dialogue around certain topics. So she wants to identify a group of people who she says are, in fact, creating what she calls an intellectual dark web. And these are people who, according to her, are doing an end run around the conventional ways in which people talk to the public through the New York Times or traditional media. Instead, they're setting up podcasts. They're uh, using YouTube. They're using a variety of other ways in order to get their views across to a majority audience who, in Weiss's uh, view, are uh, hungry for this kind of uh, free debate and intellectual openness, as she sees it, that uh, is uh, allowing people to talk about topics that are considered to be taboo in the mainstream. Now, I will say, like, and 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 we're going to go through your piece where you where you basically outline that this is really not a new phenomenon at all. There is there's a slight difference that that really drives them in some way. But I will also say, just uh, to start it off, that um, this happened 25 years ago too with Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh at, at all when they called it the new media, right? Like they referred to talk radio as the new media at that time. Uh, Very much so. And you see the same kinds of things happening uh, with talk radio, where as a result of uh, changes in regulations, as a result of a new uh, kind of market for radio opening up, these people effectively saying that they are providing a uh, voice for all of these underheard opinions and getting congratulated by people like Newt Gingrich for doing this. And uh, Gingrich, in fact, uh, the day that he is elected the uh, leader of the House Republicans, comes on Rush Limbaugh's show in order to uh, thank him for effectively opening up the debate in ways which would allow he and people like him to be able to talk to a broader public. So, all right. So, so walk through this idea of of uh, the. I mean, take uh, um, um, uh, take Weiss for um, on her own terms for as long as you can uh, through this. I mean, let the 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 idea that these people are uh, marginalized in some fashion, or they don't have access to uh, the mainstream media. Uh, it's it's not like the only time anybody's talked about them uh, was Barry Weiss in the New York Times. Uh, I'm still waiting for my piece about uh, about this show. It's a little slow to come, uh, but uh, I mean, do do take it on her own terms. Is what she's even saying on her own terms accurate? Well, it depends on what you mean by whether these people have been silenced. Uh, well, she doesn't use the term silence, but whether these people are finding it hard to express their opinions. I think that in some senses this is true. If you look at the whole debate about Kevin Williamson, Williamson uh, effectively lost his uh, very prominent uh, new job at the Atlantic Monthly because he had been found uh, to have said in the past that he believed that women who had abortions ought to be executed by hanging. And uh, this is something which maybe... 10 or 12 years ago, people uh, would have been angry and would have been aggrieved by this kind of thing, but they wouldn't necessarily have been able to persuade a uh, big mainstream publication like The Atlantic to uh, fire somebody. This would have been taken as being part of the cut and thrust of debate, and certainly it's kind of a deplorable view. But you have to hear conservatives, you have to express all perspectives, you have to have uh, a certain degree of uh, 
contrary opinion in order to allow free speech to happen. And now I think, for better or for worse, you see that when people like Williamson uh, say these kinds of things, they're liable to get a huge crowd of people uh, outraged and are rising against them in ways which I think are much more effective than they used to be. So I think that uh, from Weiss's perspective, this is a very different world from the world that used to be 10 or 15 years ago. And of course, Weiss has experienced some of this herself. Uh, she uh, has not been particularly popular among many liberals. Many people have deplored her uh, getting a uh, position at the New York Times op-ed page. And people have suggested that some of the things that she has said have been culturally insensitive in ways that have made them want to uh, get her uh, uh, demoted or fired or otherwise uh, suffering for uh, saying things they believe that she shouldn't have said. So now, is there, but when we talk about this, I mean, is this a function of maybe the Atlantic is placed in a slightly different context than it was in the past? Um, and, you know, it's not, what comes to mind is just maybe it's a coincidence, but it's the most prominent example. Like Barry Weiss was trying to get professors uh, Columbia fired uh, for their views on Israel. Uh, it just comes to mind. I remember Juan Cole was supposed to get uh, an appointment. I think it was at Brown, maybe. Uh, or, or I can't remember which East Coast institution it was, but um, uh, funders kept him from from getting that position because of his uh, positions on Israel. I mean, this dynamic where entities um, don't want someone speaking there, it's not, you know, I, I don't think I could get hired at Breitbart, um, you know, never even for five minutes. And then there would be an outcry, I think, and then I would get fired. Uh, but I couldn't even get initially fired there at those outlets is it is it is it is that is it a real dynamic other than you know what is just sort of normal what the market for my product will bear well i think that the i think that the market has shifted in some important ways and as you say uh, I'm not sure whether Weiss herself was involved in the Juan Cole thing. I think that may have been... No, she wasn't involved in she that. A, she was doing that yeah, at Columbia, but, but completely she was distinct. involved in the Columbia, yeah, and the, the David Project. And uh, certainly she uh, seemed to be uh, pretty enthusiastically on, uh, on board with the general movement, which sought to see various uh, professors uh, uh, working on Middle East issues being fired uh, for views that uh, were... Uh, that, that, that were uncongenial to people uh, like uh, Barry Weiss, who had uh, quite strong sympathies with the state of Israel. So you, you, uh, you certainly see this. Uh, I, I think you do see a change, which is that it's, it used to be that uh, there were certain kinds of opinions which would uh, be, uh, could plausibly be used to mobilize against you and to attack you. And I think that the, uh, we've seen some important shifts in the kinds of opinions that are considered to be sufficiently out of the mainstream uh, that you are open to attack. So that I think one of the big examples here, and this is something that sprang up with one of the people who Weiss identifies as being her uh, dark web intellectuals, and that is the uh, atheist author Sam Harris. Uh, a, a number of uh, weeks ago, Harris sought to uh, revivify uh, the uh, debate over uh, race and IQ by uh, interviewing Charles Murray, a, a pretty notorious, uh, pretty notorious uh, social scientist of sorts uh, who has worked for a variety of think tanks and who had suggested that effectively African-American people uh, systematically and likely for genetic reasons have lower IQs than other people. So, so Harris sought to revive this, got some vigorous pushback uh, from Ezra Klein, among other people, and uh, has professed himself to be offended about the uh, about the ways in which, in his perspective, free debate over civ over contentious issues is much much more difficult than in the past, and he views this as being a bad thing. Where uh, and and I think this this kind of uh, sense that uh, certain kinds of things uh, which used not be too controversial to say and which have become controversial, I think this is really what's driving a lot of the unhappiness that Weiss has. Uh, frankly, I think that it's less about, as indeed for any of us, I think it's less about uh, the fact that opinions in general are being silenced 
as against about the fact that opinions achieve views of being within the reasonable mainstream of things that ought to be debated, being silenced, and that is what is getting her rise up. Right. So this is just my issue set is now becoming considered um, a, a sort of a, a, a somewhat toxic, and I don't like that. Is I mean is is a lot of this and and walk us through uh, because you 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 make the case in your piece that this is it's that very uh, issue is that from a relative perspective it, were these guys trying to promote these same ideas fifteen twenty years ago they would have no problems and in fact I would argue uh, you know maybe maybe thirty years ago twenty years ago. Uh, it, they, not only would they have no problems, they wouldn't even gain the, the same measure of prominence because on some level it would have been almost too tame uh, where they come in on this uh, on some level. I mean, just walk us through that a little bit and give us a little bit of that history um, of when, you know, the New Republic was much more amenable to ideas like this. Well, I think that the key example of this, which I think you're pointing towards here, was the notorious uh, special issue of the New Republic, uh, edited by Andrew Sullivan, which effectively took on Charles Murray's uh, most toxic and inflammatory claims as being a central organizing theme, this idea that there was a relationship between race and IQ and that this relationship was genetic, and then used it as the basis for an issue in which uh, Murray's views were presented and then were debated. And this special issue has, I think, acquired a pretty considerable degree of notoriety. And I cannot imagine uh, the New Republic, certainly today, or Slate, which also uh, published some uh, contrarian uh, stuff on this by Will Salatan, who I have to say to his credit has uh, recently written in order to say uh, what a terrible idea that, that, that this was, or any other mainstream publication. I cannot imagine today that you would see a, uh, any of these publications publishing a special issue which took such a toxic and inflammatory set of questions as being a serious topic for debate. And I, I've got to say, there was one other very, very interesting kind of implicit dialogue that's happened over the last couple of weeks, which is uh, that there was a, that in the wake of Williamson's firing, there was a big meeting that happened in the Atlantic where somebody leaked a transcript of uh, what, uh, what uh, Goldberg, the editor, had discussed and also the uh, prominent voice of Tennessee Coates who talked about his experience and the experience of being an African-American public opinion, uh, public uh, intellectual and uh, opinion writer and so on, and uh, how he had felt during his time uh, at the Atlantic. And, uh, and so Coates said that when he, when he had written for the Atlantic, he had had to go in and in his words, uh, you can see me arguing online with Andrew Sullivan about whether black people are genetically disposed to be dumber than white people. I actually had to take this seriously, you understand. I couldn't speak in a certain way to Andrew. I couldn't speak to Andrew on the blog the way I would speak to my wife about what Andrew said on the blog in the morning when it was just us. And then he uh, says that uh, even recognizing who Andrew Sullivan was and what he was, he learned from him about his craft and his voice. And then uh, Sullivan wrote a couple of days ago in response to uh, a recent piece on Coates and also this uh, broader set of questions about intellectuals uh, and what they can or cannot say. And he wrote about how he deplored the fact that we had left a time in which it was possible for him and Tennessee Coates to have a disagreement uh, about the subject of identity uh, politics, but where there was a civility about it, a generosity of spirits that transcended the boundaries of race and background. So, and I'm, I know I'm going on here, but it seems to me that there's an important, uh, interesting difference of uh, perceptions and uh, memories here, where for Sullivan, this is a open, clear debate where we can be civil and we can be generous to each other. And Coates, experiencing exactly the same kind of debate, is saying that this is a debate where he effectively could only participate if he shut up about what he actually thought about what Sullivan was saying. And I think that the change from that world in which somebody like Tennessee Coates had to shut up into a world where he can push back against this is the world that is making a lot of people very, very uncomfortable. And and it and, and we should be clear, it's making it uncomfortable to those people who have who are having to sort of deal with um, 
deal with arguments that they hadn't had to deal with before and having to cede some of the the just the territory right i mean the, like the 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 idea i mean it's it's almost comedic in a way the the idea of of andrew sullivan saying like i had this there was a time where we could just share and just uh, intellectualize over whether or not the person I'm talking to is from a, a genetically inferior race. <laughs> and that genetically inferior uh, race uh, person was, was an exception. Uh, but he was perfectly uh, polite about discussing this with me. And now I feel like that's lost. Like the it's it is it's almost funny if it wasn't so sad that um, that that he has those type of blinders on uh, that. I, I, I don't know. And, and I want to just introduce this concept, too, because uh, I, I don't know if it's fair to say this about any of the people in the intellectual dark web. Um, but I certainly have been unfair enough to suggest for the, this as the uh, for a couple of people in that group. Uh, you talk briefly about um, uh, Philip Kitcher's writing in a book called uh, In yep. Science, Truth and Democracy. That there is an epistemic, uh, epistemic, uh, excuse me, epistemic, epistemic, yes, yeah. bias in favor oh, yeah, uh, yeah. of sorts yeah. of arguments that these thinkers embrace, uh, because they're talking to uh, an audience, and this is sort of, this is uh, sort of like I guess getting back to talk radio on some level that um, uh, that Kitcher felt that there was definitely um, mm. there was there was there was money in them their hills. Right. I mean, that this yeah. this stuff well, can I be think, monetized. Yeah. Yeah. And and here I think there is, you know, there if you certainly look at talk radio, you know, so you see the vast political economy, which uh, springs up as a result of it, and which then uh, gives rise to Fox News, which uh, in which Ailes uh, is, is uh, commissioned to create Fox News because Murdoch has uh, has done, gotten a report written, which more or less says there's room out there for talk radio to be done with video, and we need to get somebody to do it. So there, there is an economy which revolves around this. And also, I think, uh, and in fairness, you know, so the, a lot of the people who are identified in the dark web intellectuals, you know, some of them may not have sort of uh, subscribed to some of these things. Uh, some of them may not even have been consulted all that much before they were so branded. But there is also for, I think, some of them, there's a kind of a contrarian impulse, which springs on the one hand from the delight in seeming to be an, quote, independent and uh, and uh, free thinking person who is fearless about what they say. And on the other hand, in knowing that you are getting a, a pretty big cheerleading uh, faction of people who are finding that their prejudices around a particular community, a particular group are being confirmed by what seem to be sober, neutral and scientific people. And I think if you look at the history of racist speculation about people's intelligence, or if you look at the uh, speculation about women's intelligence or abilities to do their jobs or whatever, you see a pattern where again and again and again, you see different spurious and pseudoscientific scientific reasons being advanced or theories being advanced as to why it is that uh, black people are less intelligent than white people or why it is that women are incapable of doing this, that and the other. And the science changes dramatically from uh, theory to theory. But what doesn't change at all is the prejudice. And that suggests to me and uh, indeed to Kitcher, and I think this is what he's phrase framing in a very polite and philosophical way, that suggests that it's really something around the Social, uh, the, you know, the social dynamic, which is unleashed by the uh, existence of these broadly shared prejudices, that is what is driving the quote research unquote, rather than any kind of neutral and dispassionate spirit of scientific inquiry. And and, and so what we're talking about is that that you also write is the uh, sort of the, the 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 central organizing principle of these guys is a is a pushback against uh, multiculturalism, right? And and and. Um, and, and talk about that pushback and its implications for, for status threat, uh, threat to status. Oh. Be, because, uh, I mean, oh. one of the things that we've yeah. talked about in this office uh, very recently is this concept that as multiculturalism uh, becomes more prominent in this country, there are losers, I mean, that there are, that, that, yeah. you know, v definitionally, if you go from a uniculture uh, to a multiculture, 
you know, there's only one culture and um, it, there's going to be losers. And those are going to be the people who were in the uni culture, I guess. I think that's right. Well, let me first complicate slightly what I said, which is that uh, there, uh, on the one hand, I think that there is a clear kind of status threat thing going on. On the other hand, uh, it also can be that uh, some of the people who are looking at this from the other side of the perspective, who are driving or pushing different perspectives, these people can be jerks too. You know, so human beings can be jerks, and it doesn't matter what political affiliation or what set of values you have. Uh, we're all familiar with the fact that there are plenty there are plenty of assholes to go around on the left, just as there are on the right. And uh, some of the people who uh, may have been pushed into this may be pushed in because they reasonably feel that they are uh, dealing with completely unreasonable unreasonable people at the other side of the, uh, you know, on the other side. Uh, and here, uh, two of the people who are named uh, in the uh, dark web intellectual uh, piece were uh, professors at Evergreen uh, College, who uh, I think, you know, sort of basically walked into a buzzsaw. And one of the people who was not named, and I think she wrote a very, very interesting article for the Chronicle on this, is Alice Dreger, who uh, is somebody who has gotten into a lot of uh, political hot water as a result of some of her writing, but who also basically says she doesn't want to associate with, with the dark web intellectual movement because she sees it as being a movement which is devoted to stirring up controversy and annoying people in its own right, rather than just pursuing the truth where uh, you want it to go. But that said, I think that there are some very, very clear tendencies among some of the people within this to resent the fact that 20 or 30 years ago, it used to be pretty straightforward to be able to say this stuff and to be accepted as a member in good standing of uh, a broader intellectual community. Whereas uh, now, if you say things uh, or if you speculate about the uh, about the, the question of whether or not uh, black people are more or less intelligent than white people, you're going to get something like the same kind of reaction that you get if you speculate about whether or not, uh, I don't know, uh, Jewish people are uh, more uh, avaricious and hungry for money than are non-Jewish people. Uh, this is going to be seen, in other words, as being an expression on your part of some kind of a innate um, sort of desire to find some discreditable and nasty theory to be true rather than being a uh, expression of your uh, you know, sort of your your freedom from uh, all sorts of bias and your commitment to the truth so i i do suspect that we are going to see on the fringes of this movement and uh, this is something that Weiss, in complete fairness to her, clearly worries about and is potentially upset by, you see a tendency uh, from some of the people within this movement to uh, embrace people like Milo Yiannopoulos, Mike Cernovich, uh, Alex Jones, some of the really uh, kind of crazy and frankly depraved voices uh, on the um, sort of outright uh, tending into uh, out-and-out paranoia. And uh, I, I would not be surprised if uh, we see a couple of people who are in the dark web intellectual movement moving from using the kinds of colorful uh, metaphors that uh, are used in the Weiss article to describe their awakening experience where it says, you know, so it's basically like they uh, you completely woke up one day and they're going to start talking about how they've been red pilled in just the same way as people in the alt-right and people in the nastier, uh, nastier uh, reaches of the far right talk about how they suddenly realized uh, that they were being imprisoned by these uh, liberal and feminist ideas and then uh, struck out to the alt-right in order to find an alternative. Um, we, you know, uh, there's a couple of things I want to go from here, but Barry Weiss said, uh, she tweeted out uh, the other day, and, and we can put these uh, these tweets up. Um, she, she wrote, uh, the... The gateway drug to those flirting with the alt right. Uh, oh, you just went back. The gateway drug to those flirting with the alt right are actually pieces like this, and it refers to um, a Vanity Fair piece describing Jodis, uh, Jordan Peterson as a gateway drug to those uh, flirting with the uh, the far right. Uh, and then she goes on to basically say there are two reasons uh, that she has a problem with this. Uh, that failing to draw distinctions between people like Sam Harris and, and people like Richard Spencer strips the designation of alt-right and its power of its power and meaning. 
And I would argue maybe that's the case, but I don't think that's what people are doing. That, you know, one is the gateway and, uh, you know, one is uh, the, the destination. Nevertheless, she writes, uh, when the labels used pr- uh, promiscuously, people start to take it less seriously and we should be taking the actual alt-right seriously. She then goes on to say, second, when conservatives, classical liberals, and I am sorry to laugh when <laughs> I read that, or libertarians are told by the progressive chattering class that they or that or those they read. And, and I got to say, like, when I'm referred to as the progressive chattering class, all I want to do is expropriate capital. That's all I want to do. But um, uh, or those they read are all right. The very common response is to say, screw it. They, they, they think everyone's all right. Then those people move further right. Now, there's a couple of things that I, I'd like you to, to address. Uh, the first part um, is this idea. Just to scroll back up to that first tweet is that um, isn't taking the alt right seriously. Part of that is we should see how people get there. Yeah. Well, here there are, uh, I guess, first question is about the alt right and how people got to the alt right. And there are some people, and here, for example, there's a book by Angela Nagel called Kill All Normies, where she argues that the alt right is effectively it's a reaction, it's a counter reaction to the excesses of feminism. That uh, in her telling the story, that you get all of these. Uh, crazy virtue feminist, feminists who are into uh, one-upping each other online, and that this helps to provoke this counter-reaction that then becomes the alt-right. I don't, myself, from uh, what studies I've done of the alt-right, think that this really provides a good theory of how, in fact, it worked. Instead, uh, you, if you look back, and if you look back at the earlier uh, stirrings of what became the alt-right, you see that it isn't really linked so much to, uh, fen- uh, to uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, the stronger or more condemnatory forms of feminism that uh, you find uh, some, people, uh, some people exercising, as much as it was to just women, gay people, trans- transgender people and others intruding into spaces that uh, had being considered by a bunch of young white guys to be their spaces and uh, for these people to be making uh, pretty limited demands for recognition and for acceptance that these people found to be uh, grossly offensive to their uh, to their uh, to their sense of political identity and this also gets mixed in with a whole bunch of pre-existing nasty political tendencies which uh, you get in the uh, men's right activist movement which you get in further reaches of the uh, far right which are creating their own social spaces and uh, this becomes the kind of toxic mess that it because that then generates Gamergate and then generates the online alt right that we all know and love so intimately today. So it's kind of it's you know you you can make the counter argument and nobody has anything that resembles very strong statistics to one way or the other. But I've got to say that when somebody like Barry Weiss makes that argument, it's pretty clearly an argument that flatters her own sense of the world and her own beliefs about the kinds of things that people should or should not be saying. And so as a result, I think it's reasonable to discount it unless she had some uh, real evidence to produce. And to my knowledge, she has not produced any evidence, some independent evidence that gives you some sense that, in fact, this theory that she has is correct. And as you say, you know, there are a lot of people, including people on the right side of the spectrum, who've made quite a lot of fun of her for uh, you know, really making this kind of claim, which just, to me at least, uh, doesn't seem to be particularly probable. It also, um, it seems to me also, uh, I mean, it to make a claim like that would suggest the that the the uh, it sort of does a disservice to these intellectuals, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean that that they. I mean, it's it seems to me, and I and I. I don't necessarily, um, uh, you know, run in intellectual circles. Uh, and, and, and as a professor, I, I suspect that you do far more than I. Um, but do you find that uh, intellectuals develop their uh, their their thoughts and their theories and their uh, uh, their uh, ideologies and philosophies just based upon what somebody online called them? <laughs> 
and they just said, screw it. I'm going full hog into this. I mean, maybe there is some of that, I guess, but I feel like that's a little bit, I feel like if somebody accused me of that, I would be offended. Like if someone said yeah, your well, politics are just the, a function because, yeah. you know, someone called you on the phone and called you uh, some type of lefty and you were like, OK, I'm going to show them I'm going to get even more lefty than I was before. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's pretty implausible. Uh, Matt Iglesias had a uh, tweet, I think, where he more or less said this, that maybe maybe it kind of works in order to explain how people on mass can get and sort of socialized into the alt-right, but it probably doesn't work for intellectuals. I'm not sure that it works for either uh, the the uh, the general mass of people or for intellectuals. And I think part of uh, part of uh, what's going on here is that we all universally we have a, a tendency to look for to look for rationalizations for the decisions that we took. And very often, you know, the rationalization that uh, I'm I'm only doing this because of the crazy and evil things which uh, you have done in order to push me into this position. But that rationalization, uh, you know, sort of uh, can provide people with a sense of some justified reason for why they sometimes change their beliefs. You know, sort of the uh, uh, there used to be a joke on uh, the back in the dawn age, ages of blogging about how people, you know, sort of they used, uh, you know, so sort of they used to be on the uh, left or on the democratic side until uh, 20 years after the event during the Iraq, Iraq war, they retrospectively became enraged by Chappaquiddick and by Ted Kennedy. And I think that there is uh, something like that that happens here. You know, so if you, uh, you, you know, so perhaps there are some people who have conversion experiences and why certainly have been talking to people with conversion experiences, but the reasons that people give for radical shifts in their opinions and their understanding of the world are very often not plausibly the reasons that actually drove them to make the changes that they did make. Is this, am I mistaken, or is this a dynamic uh, that is on the right and barely on the left? I mean, I've heard Christine Todd Whitman. I, I sat next to Christine Todd Whitman when she told me that the reason why conservatives were so adamant in denying um, uh, climate change was because liberals make such a stink about it. I mean, I have never heard, well, I've never, and so that dynamic has been out there. I've never heard this dynamic really go the other way. I've never heard a, um, you know, uh, a, a socialist or an anarcho-communist or an anti-fascist. I mean, I guess, I guess an anti-fascist is built upon fascists existing, but it's not because somebody said, you're you seem somewhat anti-fascist that that anti-fascist, well, I'm going to get even more anti-fascist now because you're already labeling me that way. So I might as well, like, am I mistaken or does that just seem to go one, one direction? I've, I've never heard that claim being made seriously by anybody about people on the left like you. Uh, There may be people who've made that claim. Uh, I can't say that I'm aware of who they are. And I just don't. I I don't think that it's a pl- it's a really plausible description of how most people change their minds about politics. I, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I guess the challenge for Barry Weiss would be, and for people who make this claim, like Whitman, uh, again, would be if you really want to make this claim, which kind of flatters you in a certain sense because it suggests that. Uh, it suggests that the problem is on the other side, in a sense, uh, rather than uh, rather than with the people who are being radicalized. Uh, show some evidence. Find some evidence. Show us some some kind of a good independent body of evidence uh, which shows how this can happen on a pretty large scale. And then maybe we'll believe that something that it's true. Uh, but the fact that but why do you there think doesn't it... seem to be that evidence. Why do you think, I mean, putting, putting aside that the, the claim is sort of, why do we always, why does that, when we hear that claim, it comes from the right as opposed to the left? I mean, it, it seems like on some level it is a surrogate for, you know, that notion of, of, cla- of status threat, right? Like the presence of you and your increased prominence and it, and it it ultimately gets translated into like the way you're talking or the way that you are imposing something on me. The, the, this dynamic of your presence or your speech is an imposition on me that is causing my reacting. 
seems yeah. to be almost like a surrogate for the real issue, which I think on some of us is like, hey, I'm losing my status or like, you know, like it, and this isn't just with the intellectuals. We're talking about your average person who responds to this. I mean, I use the example of like, you know, when when my dad and certainly my grandfather, uh, you know, was was my age and was, uh, you know, going into work or whatnot, like the idea that you couldn't say like nice gams to uh, one of your co-workers, you know, the secretary, I guess, at that time, like you couldn't say like nice legs or, you know, I like what your dress, honey, you know, th- th- my my dad my my mom was his chattel at one point right i mean uh, theoretically uh and i can't even say nice gams to a girl uh like i've lost something as a as a white guy i i think there's something to that i think that there's also and this is again hinted at by the uh whitman thing uh, my personal completely unproven theory would be that a lot of this is uh, coming from the right about the left because the right has a hell of a lot more explaining to do over the last 20 to 30 years than the, than, than the left does. You know, if you look at the radicalization of the uh, right, you know, the fact that as Dave Roberts said on Twitter this morning, uh, you know, so we are the basic problem is that we are dealing with a country in which this almost deranged social movement of uh, people who have no real grasp on reality uh, are playing a dominant role in our politics, and this is what we need to be talking about. But this presents huge problems for you if you are somebody who sees yourself as being, quote, reasonable, unquote, and also tending towards uh, the right in some way or another. You, uh, you know, you're left with a very, very awkward set of things to explain about the people who are supposedly on your side. And it becomes much, much easier, I think, to uh, pull a two quoque, as uh, the rhetorical term is, a you, uh, a, um, sort of a, a you too, or it's, it's really your fault kind of thing, uh, to uh, push back against people on the left who are basically telling you, um, sort of, why the hell are you associating with these crazy people? Uh, it's an easy way for you to try and uh, put the black, blame back on them. What? Where are we on the trajectory of these uh, of, of these ideologies? I mean, is that uh, you know? And I think uh, on some level, it's a, it's an obvious question. But I mean, where does this does that level of embarrassment indicate that you know we're in the final stages? <laughs> uh, is there some type of like you know um, uh, like psychological trajectory for these type of things? I wish I could say that I thought that was true. I don't think so. I think we are seeing we are seeing some splitting happening on the right. Because one of the interesting things uh, that we are seeing on global warming is people like, uh, say, for example, uh, Jerry T- Taylor, who used to be at Cato and has gone to Niskanen, uh, more or less, was completely changing uh, his tune on global warming because he was convinced by the experts. We're seeing a number of people in the intellectual class, I think, who were previously centrist tending towards right, beginning to embrace the uh, liberal left, uh, not completely, but to a much greater uh, extent than in the past. But I think more broadly, we're seeing a uh, we're seeing a social environment and in particular an informational environment, which means that I think the crazy is going to get higher before it begins to deflate. And here, if you think about the ways in which, as you say, this goes back in many ways to talk radio, it goes back to Fox News. We've had a lot of crazy uh, on the right in this country long before we had uh, social media, before we had Twitter, before we had any of this. Uh, This is all about constructing separate realities based on uh, different kinds of facts. And I think that over uh, over the next few years, we're going to see how it becomes more and more easy to uh, generate apparently convincing new facts, quote unquote, as uh, people get more sophisticated about how to poison existing repositories of information out there, as institutions such as the U.S. Census come under increasing attack, as we begin to see uh, techniques such as adversarial generative, generative adversarial networks being used to uh, generate fake video and fake uh, fake audio that uh, appears convincingly to uh, make it appear that uh, people have said things that they haven't said. Uh, I mean, 
my depressing fear is that we ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah, I I tend to agree with that. Uh, Henry Farrell, Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at George Washington University. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much. Thank you. All right, folks, going to take a uh, quick break. We were talking about that. Uh, we, remember we we saw that. Uh, didn't we maybe make, even make a video of it, that um, Adobe uh, technology where you could just say something, or you could type something and get somebody else's voice? Yeah. And we have, well, we have that Google thing uh, about them calling up local restaurants that we can also do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's play that today. I'm so tired of all of these liberal talk show people from people of color backgrounds taking my spot, God damn it. Who's that? Is that uh, That's the Adobe we're working on of you. <laughs> well, honestly, as he was saying that, as honestly as he was saying that, I was thinking like, I wonder if it's going to be possible I like, could just literally phone it in with like a holographic vision, a version of me <laughs> where I speak and the words seem to come out. Like, guys, I'm, guys, I need to focus. <laughs> you just type that's, it. That's a hologram of Sam. I can't. Mm. <laughs> it's a zero mm. sum game. <laughs> <laughs> And it just be like it'll be just like that one little glitch that gives away that I'm not here to even people in the office. Like, <laughs> wait, what? Oh God, he's doing it again. I could have used one of those the other night when I was recording till two a.m. Here, it's just Sam's hologram. Use your own hologram. Yeah, of me. I thought about trying to replace myself with the uh, talking Dennis Miller doll, but uh, I think the things we say are a bit different. There was, at one point, um, when I was doing uh, That's Bullshit, it was a series of about 15 videos I did, I recorded a bunch with a bear, like a stuffed bear. Uh, and I think we even did the, uh, the, the opening. In for Sam Cedar, this teddy bear. And the idea was like, now I won't have to shoot any more video. I can just record the audio track. Because the idea is that it's just the bear talking. Um, not exactly the same thing, but that just popped into my head. So, sure, there you have it, of course. Um, you know, since we were talking about Dave Rubin, let's just talk about this for a moment. And um, I, I had been alluding to uh, Dave Rubin's support from essentially the Koch brothers, and, I'll, and I'm going to walk you through uh, this in a second, but um, Alex Koch apparently does some work with uh, TYT. I met this guy the other night, actually, but uh, he, he tweeted out something that somebody sent to me. Um, he, uh, he works at uh, TYT, investigates in uh, Reed Sludge, I guess. And yeah, slu- yeah, he's really good. Yep. And um, he found a video that I, somehow we had missed. Uh, or, uh, yeah, and he had posted it and it's from 20, it's from September of 2016. Now it's, it's not, uh, it's all audio, but I'm going to read the titles to you so that, uh, so that you will know what it says. And because, you know, one of the things, and I don't know if this was, uh, prominently featured in the, uh, I can't remember now, to be honest with you, in the, uh, the Barry Weiss piece. Did it, did it mention his funding? No, he, he, he is presented as being fully fan funded. And, um, you know, we don't even present it as fully fan funding. I just, you know, I say like, you know, 90 some odd percent of our uh, funding comes from uh, uh, from the viewers, but whatnot. But um, we certainly to the extent that we're not fully fan funded, it is all, um, you know, ads on YouTube or uh, ads that we have in the show. We have no sponsors. We have no big money behind us, institutional money. And I don't know that there's necessarily a problem with it. It's not necessarily something that I would want uh, per se. But when you're getting ideological money from behind, uh, you know, supporting you, it's very hard to make the argument that you're not ideological. And even if, let's say, I don't know, um, George Soros was to be funding me. Uh, I think not only would I disclose that, but the argument saying like, I'm just, just, I'm just throwing around ideas. I'm just, I'm going where the intellectualism takes me. 
And if that takes me to, uh, you know, finding that George Soros is, a, is the evil mastermind of uh, the Illuminati, then so be it. Uh, well, now, I'm not going to go there because George Soros is, is paying me, right? Um, here's a video that was released. It was released in September of 2016. I don't know when their relationship started, but uh, here it is. Meet Dave Rubin, host of The Rubin Report. He believes in free speech and exploring big ideas. He engages people with diverse viewpoints. Adam Carolla. Ayan Hirsi, Ali, Sam Harris, Don Lemon. That's why we're partnering with him to bring you interviews about freedom and other issues like censorship, free speech, pause it, climate change, trans issues, Black Lives Matter, capitalism, libertarianism, immigration, Ayn Rand, Bernie Sanders, feminism, war on drugs, religion, free will. From the professors and intellectuals, uh, from the best professors and intellectuals we know. <laughs> the Rubin Report. Learn liberty. And then we whip up a project of IHS. IHS. I wonder what that could be. Learn maybe liberty. It's a group of, of uh, patrons who teamed up together, maybe. It could be. Yeah. It could be Community some fan. Group. Yeah. Like a fan group. Like a fan they're, they're, super they're, group. From... The professors and intellectuals we know best. So, in other words, we are helping to uh, book Dave Rubin's show. We, us here at the IHS. Well, Learn Liberty is a project of the Institute for Humane Studies, IHS. Each year, IHS runs educational talent development programs for students, including free, wow, week-long summer seminars that feature some of the faculty on Learn Liberty. We got to go to that. Brendan, uh, pack your bags. Uh, IHS also awards scholarships, hosts webinars, and provides other... Fo wow, this is a great organization. They must have a lot of money. Through these programs, IHS promotes the study of liberty across a broad range of disciplines. Well, let's see. Uh... The uh, go to IHS and the Institute Board of Directors includes Charles G. Cook, Brian Hooks, Tyler Cohen, Art Pope, of all people from North Carolina. Very interested in big ideas. That Big guy. ideas. David Humphrey, Scott Bule, Christopher Coyne, Todd Zawicki, Kristen Kendall, Ryan Stowers, Chris Rufer. They've received funding from a number of foundations, including the Sarah Scaife Foundation, as in Melon Scaife. Those folks brought you the uh, the Clinton Whitewater scandal. Oh, I thought they were the folks behind the uh, Big Think series. John oh, Templeton Foundation, the Marcus Foundation, the John William Pope Foundation. I believe that might be one of our Pope's uh, relatives. Um, it goes on. The Koch Family Foundations, of course, the Searle Freedom Trust. You can look all of these up, folks. Um, and, uh, Coke is a, uh, the IHS's chief financial officer told the New York times in 2012, uh, this is in, in light of a, uh, uh, a, a legal dispute between Charles Coke and the Cato Institute, uh, that Coke is a longtime generous supporter of ours. We're not involved as a political organization. Charles Coke donated a total $12.4 million to the organization from 2008 to 2012. That's quite a bit of money. John uh, William Pope Foundation donated $2.1 uh, since 1986. Uh, Rand Paul has, of course, uh, uh, sent a fundraising letter, sinking gifts. Now, the other funny part about this is that this is housed at George Mason University. And you will recall about a couple of weeks ago, there was a story about how the Koch brothers had, during this time in particular, had an incredible amount, not even an incredible amount, the t entire amount of ability to hire and fire professors, uh, which, of course, is a slight infringement upon academic liberty. Uh, what Charles Koch and other donors to George Mason University got for their money. Now, the only reason why I say this is because you have Dave Rubin saying that he is a classical liberal. Now, you can laugh at that because okay. it's funny. But um, 
I wonder what makes him a classical liberal as opposed to a libertarian. Has he ever talked about this? I know for at one point he was for single payer health care, but he seems to have dropped that from his justification. Um, has he ever talked? Classical liberals are fairly libertarian, as I understand it. I wonder what the difference is. I mean, I, I mean, I think you would agree that we're fairly liberal. But I don't like. The, I, I wonder what the difference is. I mean, between, they believe in free markets and stuff. He's uh, getting, and I don't know how much money it is from them, uh, but they're they sound to be sound like they're they claim that they're we are booking their guests. I would say one difference is uh, he probably is more valuable to people like that calling himself a classical liberal than a libertarian. Right, because it sounds like it's something other than being a libertarian. Yeah, it's branding. It's branding. And so um, and it's also they... sort of seems to me to be um, somewhat uh, a failure of a reporter to report this in a piece. I mean, if you want to talk about someone being marginalized, I mean, I suppose you could say like the Koch brothers are also marginalized. It's very difficult for them to go and hang out with liberal people because they're so demonized. You know, I think they actually perceive it that way. If you dip into that's, I mean, the sense of aggrievement goes up that high where multi-billionaires who control American politics actually do think that they're marginalized because they don't get, you know, because Jane Mayer investigates them. Right. I, I think that's a real thing. I, I, I mean, I think that's probably true. Yeah, And people are allowed to write mean things about them online now. And whereas, you know, there was a time where, you know, if, if you were in a debate with Tom Hasey Coates about whether or not. Uh, people of his race were uh, were inherently uh, inferior in terms of intellects. I'm just saying in terms of intellect. Yeah, uh, could be anything. That um, he, <laughs> he would be polite about it. But now it seems like they're, you know, folks like that are being, you know, very, I thought word, when up, up. Up in front, in your face about it. Up at the, sort of, but up, sort of like, like up, shorten it, like, like uppish, uppish, uppishness, uppishness about up, it. There's an up, uppishness. Upward. Yeah, but I remember a couple of years ago when it's when, when, when well, upworthy when Tanahisi Coates told Andrew Sullivan that he wasn't particularly interested in relitigating a debate about his basic humanity. I just was like, oh my god, how arrogant can you yeah, be? It's just unbelievable. Yeah, but on the other hand, if Tanahisi Coates w didn't shut up and pushed Andrew Sullivan, Andrew Sullivan might have became a racist. Right. Mm. Right. That's that's the that's the really really fine line. Because yeah. Because if you explore it too deeply, then Andrew Sullivan will have no choice but to say publicly what he said to people who worked for him privately <laughs> several years ago, which is, if everybody was equal, why didn't Africa take over the world? Right. And it's that type of cutting edge Oxford Union debate insight that you can't say publicly, but really shapes the heart of the intellectual dark web. Here is uh, the thing that people have to remember, and I want you to just understand this as you go out there, folks. These not quite racist people <laughs> are teetering <laughs> on a razor's edge. That's right. That's right. Not quite. When you speak to them, be gentle. Don't use a lot of breath in your voice, <laughs> because if you do, you could just blow them over the other side of that razor's edge. Yeah, I know. I've been all down wrong. to and then they slide down into racist world. I've been all wrong about Sam Harris. <laughs> don't don't do that. I've been we, all we get, wrong about strike. I know. I got to say to Sam Harris. uh I'm sorry. I realize now that the fact that you said you're open to universal basic income obviously means that you can't be racist. Your I harassment definition. of Harris yes. could have made him bring Charles Murray on. It, In I, fact, that's I what he said. literally right? why. I, mean, I think that that is, a, well, I think their, their harassment of Charles Murray at Middlebury. Uh, but let, yeah, so sorry. I will not put him in context That'd be anymore. hilarious if a new word, word called harassing, where you're going <laughs> after somebody for good reason because they're... Yeah, and then, and then you realize that it's, then, then, then they're the victims. Yeah. Okay, new. It's really, it, it, it is almost like these, or it is Donald Trump intellectualism. We got to take a break and head into the fun half. Uh, just a reminder it is your support, plus that of IHS, that make this show possible every day. Uh, IHS, uh, spreading freedom and liberty everywhere in the guise of just, we're just throwing around some ideas. There's no, no millions of dollars behind these ideas. They're just. The reason why we have this funding to make this set is just a function of 
some people out there really wanting just generally ideas to, to, to be out there. Any day now, we'll get our ideas subsidized, too. Oh, yes. Well, we're just, yeah, I mean, it's very possible. Anybody like to fund some false, defamatory, and totally <laughs> unfair <laughs> ideas? Because available. Uh, I'm interested in, in shutting the, down debates in open exchange. And if you'd like to support me in that. That's right. That's the ideas that we have. The war against open exchange. I think the Koch brothers should step up yeah. if they want a real debate. They should fund both of us. That's what it is. Right? I don't understand. Yeah. If you want a real debate, fund our show too. Yeah. That way we can actually like buy enough followers. I'm not saying anybody did that. I'm not saying but anybody one did could that. If one got a, I'm not saying investment. anybody. Uh, you know promoted certain videos based upon uh, purchasing. I'm not saying anybody did that. I'm saying that we could. And then uh, we would have enough of a follower uh, that they would want, you know, someone like Dave would want to debate us. Well, we should yeah. call up one of those millionaire cultural Marxists out there. No, or be funny. actual Marxists. You Dave, know, all those wealthy... <laughs> why aren't you debating? You're looking like a goddamn pussy. <laughs> We're we don't giving want this kind of money to make. We you just like wrote a check broke. to the majority report for twelve million dollars. <laughs> and you know what? We just where do you see the merch they're going to have now? You <laughs> son of a bitch! <laughs> Michael Brooks going to have a whole goddamn <laughs> Malbrack drop for TMBS. Now you better stop being a friggin' cowardly pussy and get out there and debate. I know you're intellectually limited, but that's not the goddamn point. They're going to be carrying around those little red books all over the set. Now we're going to build the entire set out little red books. Now you get uh, out there on the field, you son of a bitch. It'll pay you to just nod along for nothing. In the meantime, uh, in the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, maybe that's what we should do. Start a uh, Dave Rubin free debate uh, 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 level. Free, of free debate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, uh, today is Monday, which means that tomorrow is Tuesday. And on Tuesdays, uh, you can see uh, The Michael Brooks Show, or you can go back and uh, check out last week's uh, episode uh, with uh, Glenn Greenwald and uh, who else was it? I, I can't remember her name. Uh, Julia Salazar. Julia Salazar. Uh, tomorrow, Allison Hartson, uh, running for Senate in California, and uh, Bashkar Sankar, a crew. And who is not running. Uh, uh, Bashkar is not. No, Bashkar is uh, running for Trinidadian Prime Minister. You can... Uh, you can subscribe to that on iTunes or on, uh, you can check it out on our uh, YouTube page. And uh, don't forget also uh, patreon.com slash the Antifada. Also subscribable to on iTunes uh, or uh, via the Patreon page. Uh, and uh, you guys just dropped the new episode. Is that right? Yeah, we did. We just put out our first premium offering for our patrons. <laughs> there it's you go. A, sec a segment we like to call Real Tanky Hours, where we uh, delve deep into the tanky internet. And this one is about the intersection of uh, Marxism and incels. There you go. Oi. Well, <laughs> 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 Just the idea of like incels, like I can't even believe that we have a term for this, that there is like enough of these people that we could talk I, about. I it just, is, it's a I specific subculture. Like it's not necessarily just people who can't get laid. I it's haven't like heard. They weaponize it. And like yeah. Well, that's, a, I haven't listened yet, but uh, somebody sent me, a, I think it's a uh, reply all. It's like a, pan a panoply show. Yeah. Apparently <laughs> the founding of that online community was done by a queer woman in Canada. And it was meant to be like a general support group for people who struggled relationally with dates. And then it became what it became. It just sort of Isn't like that migrated. After she yeah. Left, yeah. So course, basically, like actually the origins of it seem to actually, apparently, I haven't listened yet. We're like very like friendly and community support. <laughs> and then I, I, <laughs> this uh, thing that changed. This thing that Sean found is really amazing because it's basically like, Ross Dude Hat's article about how you need to redistribute sex only written from 2008, in, right? Or written in like much that? better faith. Uh, this is a recent one. Oh, geez. Because okay. I think Dude Hat's was actually written to try to scare people back from any kind of uh, redistributive politics now, by making it look horrifying. Yeah, this? he wasn't. Yeah, he wasn't. 
Oh, I see. Whereas I see. this is like, no, these people. This oh, that was that's what's, uh, that was what our buddy used to. Use, that was one of his examples. Uh, the professor, Walter Block, Walter Block would yeah. say that. Oh, he would well, compare how come, like how come how I can you dis- how can you, if you force Howard Johnson to serve everybody food, then how come <laughs> you can't force me to have sex with you? Yeah. And I remember Sam was standing there like, oh, 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 I have nothing. You win, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I can't believe Mind you said blown, that. Mind blown, sir. <laughs> uh, I think it was more, his whole thing was more about uh, gender. Like, why can't, why can't I force like a gay man to have sex with me or something if I'm not gay or something? There was one other, he had one other Well, he had of, a lot of, usually, but the, it always looped back to not paying people or being able to discriminate against black people. But yes, he was very inventive in the sex and age of consent and he was super into those comparisons yes i think all i had to say was like well i mean if you if you if you if your final word is going to be that uh my sexuality is the same as a plate of eggs that i serve uh then okay uh let's let the american public decide you're jewish aren't you um (laughs) let's let the american public decide right all right, going to take a quick break. Head into the fun half. 646-257-3920 is the number. Oh, don't forget, justcoffee.coop. Fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority. Get 10% off. See you in the fun half. Mm-hmm. 